There are so many astonishing, seemingly unexplainable features of the Great Pyramids of Giza. It makes one wonder why anyone would still believe the academic's tale of events, stating that they were the work of copper-wielding ancestors many thousands of years ago. And to sit across such vast area of land, with the largest Cheops covering many acres, yet is no more than a quarter of an inch from being perfectly cardinal aligned, just seems like a preposterous premise to push. In the previous video, the astonishing similarities that many years of exhausting research surrounding the unexplained ruins was explained, how MH the channel's producer had cataloged and mapped a number of identifiable features across many ruins, each of these identifying characteristics uniquely exclusive to one ancient civilization found upon and within unexplained ancient ruins across the entire globe. These signature similarities, and by default, their many differentiations, has allowed him to establish the identity of three separate civilizations. Civilizations which appear to have restarted consecutively, thus, as one would expect, branched off in vastly different directions of development, having to rebuild a modernized society from the remnants of the previous. Their past existences denied by historians for many years. But I strongly believe that we will be the generation which bucks the trend, shifting a paradigm which has affected nearly everyone's lives negatively in some way. As critical mass awareness approaches, as we continue to push onwards regardless of their attempts to stifle the truth, the efforts and sacrifices made, and given by individuals who perceive this deceit as a breach of all of our independent liberty as human beings, is finally cracking their shields of ignorance. Predictably, these same institutions who have made lives so difficult are now slowly admitting they did indeed once exist. The proof of these separate groups, which Mystery History's producer named the Cyclopean, Polygonal, and Neolithic civilizations, all had advanced capabilities, each separate from each other, yet fortunately, each possessing their own unique identifiable features which still litter many of these existing sites. Impenetrable fortresses, ingenious architectural design, visually impressive and mentally baffling methods of masonry are just a few of these ancient civilizations' legacies. Polygonal masonry, for example, yet to be fully understood by modern man in regard to its construction. The treasury of Atreus, which contains Cyclopean masonry techniques, displaying intimate knowledge of weight-bearing architecture, which the academically attested builders simply did not possess knowledge of. Underground towns and cities, the town in which the Flintstones inhabited, carved deep into some of the toughest bedrocks on Earth. Derinkuyu being one of the largest, which instead of being a fortress built above the ground, placed in a strategic location atop a hill or mountain, was carved into the Earth. To claim such feats were even possible by our own well-known ancient ancestors with the access to the tools they had at the time is simply a preposterous illogical stance to take. One which, if given as the answers to such sites' origins, can be seen as nothing short of the abandonment of one's senses in return for an undisturbed income flow. A ridiculous explanation for the city's origins, forced upon the academic world for fear of losing their income and career, and in turn down the throats of students who desire good grades. Stretching many kilometers into the earth, enormous rolling stones were placed at strategic passageways, and although we have no idea how they move such stones, they were clearly placed there in an attempt to stop some form of invader, one they felt as if such measures were not undertaken would have been vulnerable to. The Hypogeum in Malta with acoustic properties which we are yet to fully understand. The subject of our next video, with some astonishing discoveries we have unearthed during further research of this underground lair. These ancient sites tunneled deep underground, rumored to have been lit by miraculously clever, naturally fed gas-fueled lighting systems, balanced flames eternally, lighting the inhabitation's pathways. Yet, as mentioned in our previous investigative film, the pyramid builders were responsible for the movement of stones, which reach well into the thousands of tons, setting them quite literally a world apart in their eventual technological capabilities, 
and due to our identification of no less than three separate phases of casing stones adorned upon the Great Pyramids, which due to the decayed and incredibly eroded condition of the stones beneath them, with casing stones also varying in age. It appears clear that they were all possible conservation efforts, undertaken at different times within ancient man's past, after no less than three cyclical developments of our civilization. These factors, mystery history not only perceives as clear evidence supporting the hypothesis of multiple lost generations, but also clearly displays their different methods of accomplishing these tasks. Furthermore, they can clearly show all who wish to study them, whether attempting to amass, as the channel has, a large privately held collection of proofs, evidences, and upart studies that were hidden all over Earth regardless of one's reasoning. I implore all to merely study the casing stones of Giza's pyramids, for more than enough proof of many lost civilizations and the pyramids and their past builders' tremendous age. Additionally, we want to make it clear to all that we encourage discourse. The organically grown nature of the channel's demographic is its most important characteristic. We do not reject other people's disagreements to anything presented or that is claimed on occasion, as long as they are willing to attempt constructive discourse in the pursuit of that which is the ultimate goal, the truth. If you have made a private discovery, or would prefer subjects or opinions to be shared with the Creator with discretion, need advice or assistance regarding historical issues in any way, get Mystery History's opinion on something, don't hesitate in contacting him, the antiquarian creator who runs the show. This can be done via private email correspondence, Facebook, or Patreon. He does take a while to get back to you, but he always does. The channel, with hard-earned, hard-fought work and determination, has finally established a decent foothold in the doorway of antiquity, presenting ruthlessly logic, non-conclusive, rationally grounded ponderings, which are solely based upon facts, facts the old order have no answers to. Thus, the channel's content is now the front-runner in this cause and effect paradigm shift, slowly being witnessed all over the world. The consequential loss of academia's undeserved credibility, built upon a false persona of all-knowingness, slowly being realized by more and more people every day as a fraudulent attempt to profit from misplaced faith, thus public support and belief in their opinion diminishes by the day now perceived as a dangerous, highly efficient, naturally talented distributor and conveyor of the seeds of doubt, which sprout many curious yet logically sound questions, continues to cast this cloud of intellectual uncertainty over academia, and those who are deservedly exposed as mere regurgitators of permitted information. Or a book pusher, whose sole content is to pick on easy targets, while offering no solutions to that which they object to with such vitriol, feeding from a sour cream which they skim from the top of a divisive status quo, offering no alternatives or even instilling any passion to have any positive effect in any way. They merely profit from their obedient maintenance of a division within our species, ultimately slowing our prosperity and moralities to a near stagnation. By sticking to my ethics and being completely honest regarding every subject, every word spoken, subject by subject, we are now the forerunner in our field, a starter pack of our hidden past, with a new sister channel which stitches each journey together into larger historical picture, fashioned as hour-long multi-subject feature-length films. So regardless of your own particular format preference, the channel now caters. However, although we may have established a large seat at the table, many individuals who masquerade as having the same mission at heart are nothing but saboteurs and moles, attempting to lead its followers on a wild goose chase, diverting traffic away from burning curiosities, controlled opposition within the derogatorily labeled field of fringe research an audacious choice of wording, as it is an accusation by funders who intentionally permit only a certain area of global history to be studied, something which is far more fitting to the label fringe researcher than any astute individual who grew weary of their lack of knowledge with the method of construction of Cheops being just one among many thousands worldwide. And as promised, 
I will now expose one of these moles, their methods of misdirection, and how to spot them yourself. First, I shall play my original research on the Sphinx enclosure, who discovered it, the explanations they gave at the time, and after this previous research has been shown to you, I will explain what I find to not only be deliberately ignorant and complacent by one of the most highly regarded supposed fringe researchers of them all. Any public acceptance and acclamations should always be perceived as suspicious, simply due to the controversy of our role within challenging status quos. They should instead be looked upon as an indication that said individual is most likely compromised. This is due to their rarely being public popularizing of individuals in our field of study, and any that do are generally perceived by the powers that be as paid-off shills. Thus, the reality of the site's age is naturally far too controversial a question to ask. Anyone, alive or now dead, who claimed to be within the same field of study and discovery as me and many others, who receive such warm receptions by those they in essence should be a risk to, have outed themselves as nothing more than funded individuals, placed in particular positions of influence, on specific platforms, to try to lead a charge which, unfortunately, forms a tail-chasing orbit, one which, unless said follower recognizes these funded individuals' tactics, will never escape from, slowly extinguishing any healthy inquisitive manner as mentioned in the previous video. The severe undulating erosion upon the walls of the Sphinx enclosure undoubtedly showed that the Sphinx had been heavily weathered long before the Sahara became a desert. Therefore, one must suspect that it could indeed be over 9,000 years old. Not knowing exactly how much rainfall there's been in the distant past, the Sphinx could indeed be far older than this. The most notable scholarly advocates, Robert Scotch, argues that the Sphinx may be far older than 12,000 years. Robert Baval and Graham Hancock proposed that the Sphinx may have been built around 10,500 BC, during the last age of Leo. Anthony West believes everything on the Giza Plateau testifies to an advanced, secure, and long-settled civilization. Therefore, he suggests that the Sphinx may have been built not during the age of Leo, but a whole processional cycle earlier, in around 36,000 BC a date he feels is more in keeping with the history of Egypt as chronicled by certain Egypt kings. Regardless of an exact date, all of these talented Egyptologists propose a date set much further back within history than currently accepted, and they have provided considerable evidence to back up such conclusions. At the time of disclosure, the argument sent shockwaves through the Egyptologist establishment, not because of the datings, Egyptologists and mainstream historians have grown quite inept at ignoring data, but more because it was realized that there is, indeed, no other explanation for their arguments. There is little doubt that the Sphinx enclosure was subject to severe erosion within its lifetime, and although it could have been explained away as a naturally formed enclosure, we fortunately know from analysis that the limestone blocks dug out from there were then used within the building of nearby Sphinx Temple. Interestingly, no other site in Egypt shows the same type or degree of erosion. Was the evidence hidden away, concealed from the public in what could only be called a conspiracy? Sediments surrounding the base of the monuments and a once existing watermark upon the stones halfway up the Great Pyramid sides indicate just that. Two-inch thick salt incrustations once found within inner chambers Silt sediments rising to 14 feet around the bases of the pyramids found to contain seashells and fossils that have been radiocarbon dated at nearly 12,000 years old, have indeed slowly vanished over the years. These sediments could only have been deposited in such great quantities by major sea flooding. A watermark was also once clearly visible on the limestone casing stones of the Great Pyramid. These stones were unfortunately unknowingly removed by invading Arabs. These watermarks were halfway up the sides of the pyramid, or about 400 feet above the present level of the Nile River, 200 feet above the base. It seems the last remaining shred of evidence, the enclosure, survived due to the talented individuals that were required to spot it. Individuals who are thankfully on our side.
Egypt craves the mountains of money the structures generate, but also redistribute a small slice of such into stopping people from pondering for too long in regards to their age, astonishing construction, or indeed original purpose. The reason for the channel's creator reluctantly coming to this conclusion is that most of the content created by the individuals is done for the sole purpose of distracting said viewer and making their job of distinguishing that which is fact from that which is looser fiction, for example, the water erosion patterns do indeed exist and were first discovered by R. A. Schwaller de Lubitsch, a French mystic and alternative Egyptologist with first claimed evidence of water erosion on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure made by him in the 1950s. John Anthony West, however, not surprisingly plagiarized Schwaller's work jumping on his discovery and over a number of years, building it up as not only having a fictional origin, but also age and reason for existence, and also a widely spread conspiracy to try to quash people's suspicions of a greater age without encouraging them to pursue such watermarks further, or indeed any other possible reason for existing. All these individuals are funded deceivers conceived due to an uncontrollable rise in people that had begun approaching the obvious facts that no matter how astonishing the artifacts, the gold death masks or jewels found drenching Egypt's museums, people began to perceive truth and understanding as a far more precious thing to observe and learn from. The fact is that the Sphinx was originally surrounded by water, the enclosure merely forming its banks. However, this is probably one of the most important discoveries I have ever made by searching archives and manuscript. Most highly qualified Egyptologists know that the enclosure was built to contain a lake, called the Lake of Anubis, a dog, not a cat. Furthermore, before the Spanish invasion, a water line could be seen nearly halfway up the Great Pyramid, and as my previous video explained also, within the Great Pyramid, a layer of sea salt, nearly two inches thick in some places, was reported, although none remains to this day, as it was taken away discreetly to cover up the reality and true age of the site, that there was indeed a great flood, and third and finally, the phases of casing stones which are clear attempts to conserve the monument from further erosion can be identified as the work of at least three separate lost civilizations. This strongly suggests that throughout our existence, we have been susceptible to near extinction on several occasions. Why did the Egyptian authorities cover up what was found behind Gottenbing's door? Why was there a water line that could be seen halfway up the pyramids themselves? And why did they dispose of proof of sea flooding without telling the world? We find the entire series of events highly compelling.